you hear me? Oh, there it is. Look at that. God said, let there be sound, and there was, and behold, it was good. Anyway, um, as we get started, just a number of things that I would like to let you know. Uh, first of all, um, in case you're interested in volunteering, um, we're still looking for some people who might be um, willing to help in Bible song or in Ichthus. Please contact Wendy if you're interested in doing that. A reminder that if you know anyone who might be in need of the Grief Share program, um, we are one, running a summer session of that, and it's taking place um, on Tuesday afternoons at the Community Center of the Good Samaritan Village. Also, I'd like to let, let you know that the Frog Group is going to be meeting out at the water park today at 2 o'clock, and that um, our ice cream social is going to be coming up on August 5th. That's connected with the motorcycle and car show that's going to be going on here as well. And lastly, Backpack Blessing will be August 8th and 9th. Information on all of those things are in your bulletins. I trust you can read those over carefully and respond appropriately to them. Um, the congregation please scan. Peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Please share that peace with one another. confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and known, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you, and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Congregation may remain standing. The opening hymn is number 689, Praise and Thanksgiving. <laughs>
communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. first reading may be found on page 293 in your pew Bibles before you. The reading is from 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning with verse 20 or 42. A man from Balashalashai, bringing food from the first fruits to the man of God, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. Elisha said, give it to the people and let them eat. But his servant said, How can I set this before a hundred people? So he repeated, Give it to the people and let them eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left. He set it before them, They ate and had some left, According to the word of the Lord. The second reading is found on pages 950 and 951. The reading is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for the gospel reading. from page 
867, page 867 in the Bibles that are before you in the pew racks, I will be reading from the Gospel according to John, the sixth chapter, beginning with the first verse. Glory to you, O Lord. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This indeed is the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the Sea of Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. <coughs> but he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land towards which they were going. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Christ. The congregation may remain standing as we sing the next hymn. It's number 696. <laughs>
here today has <coughs> really so many great directions that you could have gone, so many wonderful themes that are embodied within it. In fact, when I was trying to decide about what direction I was going to go with preaching on the gospel text for today, I thought that I could probably preach about miracles and the importance of miracles and the meanings in the miracles that we find throughout the gospels and that this was the fourth of seven signs or miracles that are recorded within John's Gospel. I thought that it'd be interesting that you could kind of take a look at why does Jesus do miracles sometimes in some places with some people and not do miracles at other times and in other places with other people. For instance, he walks on water here. Apparently the boat almost miraculously crosses the water at the end of the story and Jesus feeds 5,000 people with just five barley loaves and two fish. And of course, if you look at other places in the gospel, you will find that when Jesus goes to his own hometown of Nazareth and the people there want to see him do a sign, Jesus says no. When the devil takes him out in the wilderness to be tempted, Jesus refuses to perform. And when Herod has Jesus on trial and once again, Jesus won't do miracles for him. And I thought to myself, boy, that would be a really good sermon. But not for today. So, I started to continue to look at the text, and I thought, you know, it would be interesting for us to take a look at numbers and the meaning of numbers that are there, because every once in a while, sometimes, and you're reading through the Gospels, what you will find out is that sometimes numbers are just numbers. For instance, in this story, Jesus has no control over how many people are going to be turning and following him and walking all the way around the shoreline to go to the other side of the lake. And what turns out is that there are about 5,000 that are there. Um, on the other hand, there are places in this where Jesus does have control about how many things are going to take place. So when he is presented with the small amount of food that's there, Jesus had a choice in how many disciples he was going to choose. He had a choice in how much food would be multiplied, so that meant that how much food would be left over. And of course, what we find out there is, is that in both cases, the number of baskets full of food left over and the number of disciples are both 12. And so we could take a look at what all of that means as far as what the kingdom of God is and whether there's enough or whether there's abundance. And I thought to myself that could be a really good sermon but not for today. So, I also like the line in there that said that after Jesus had done this and the people were satisfied and they had eaten their fill and they had been able to follow Jesus and see him and go all the way around and folks wanted to come and they wanted to take Jesus by force and make him king. And I thought to myself, what a contrast to the political process we see playing out in the United States right now, where I believe that we have about 852,000 different candidates for the Republican nomination. It started to dawn on me that we could actually talk about what reign and what rule and what kingdom of God really means. And I thought to myself, that could be a really good sermon. But not for today. And so I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about storms and the strong wind and the sea and the waves and what that meant for the Jewish people and about how that meant that they were in the middle of chaos or in the middle of danger. We could talk about how Jesus comes to them on that water in the midst of the darkness, which symbolizes a little bit of unclarity, misunderstanding. And we could talk about all of those different ways in which that happens along with Jesus walking on the water and, and saying to the disciples when he gets there, the only phrase that actually appears in every single book of the Bible, which is, do not be afraid. And I thought that could be a really good sermon, but not for today. 
If you guys want to hear the rest of those sermons, these texts come up once every three years. <laughs> so, I think I'm probably good until I retire on this text now. Instead, what I want to talk to you about today is really a simple question. It's not the actual question that Jesus ends up asking in this text. That, that question was, where are we to buy bread for all of these people to eat? My question, though, is related to that. The question that I have for this sermon is simply this. Are you ready? How big is your God? How big is your God? Now, if you're wondering what that has to do with this text, then I'm actually going to work us into how that plays into this story. But I need to begin in a different place with a different contrast or a different comparison. So, by a show of hands, how many of y'all know somebody that is kind of like this, that no matter what's going on, they will tell you that's impossible? You know somebody like that? You know the kind of people I'm talking about? Somebody goes, that's impossible. We can't do that. It would never work. There's not enough. I don't think so. Never in a million years. It couldn't happen. Why waste your time? You know somebody like that? I mean, it's a mindset, really, kind of of hopelessness. It's an attitude, really, kind of of despair. It's an outlook that portrays the world as being a place of scarcity. Um, it's a negative point of view. It sees the obstacles and never sees the opportunities, and unfortunately, it's actually the way some people choose to live. It's the way some people choose to view the world. It stands in stark contrast to another way. How many of you guys know people who are just about exactly the opposite of that? You know some folks that are that way? And when I say opposite, I'm not, I'm not talking about that, that, that there's the eternal optimist here. What I want to talk about is, is that rather than simply say, yeah, we could do that, I'm talking about the person who goes, hmm, I think it might be possible. I'm talking about the person who goes, hmm, we might be able to do that. Um, I'm talking about the person who kind of walks around and goes, yeah, I'm not sure exactly how we would get there, but here's something. Maybe we could start with that. The person who says, maybe. The person who says, what if we tried this? The person isn't just being overly optimistic because it's certainly not that, but it's the person who does leave open the avenue of opportunity and possibility. It's the person who tends to believe that my thoughts combined with your thoughts might actually be able to find a way. It's a person who believes that my resources combined with your resources, well, if we did that, it might actually begin to make a difference more than what I could just do on my own. It's an attitude about let's talk about what we have rather than let's dwell on what we think we don't have, right? These are very, very, very different personality traits. Everybody would agree? They're not only different personality traits, but I think that they actually begin to reveal what the person might actually begin to think and believe on the inside. It's a little dangerous to make overgeneralizations about people that you don't know very well. So I'm not going to say that Philip was like one of these people and Andrew was like the other, but let's just say that the responses that they give back to Jesus after he asks the question, where are we going to find enough bread to feed all of these people? The questions, that, or the, the responses they have back to that question definitely seem to fall on one of these two sides. In the sixth chapter of the Gospel according to John, when Jesus asked the question, where are we going to find enough bread to feed all of these people? Philip has the mind that's like a human calculator, and he all of a sudden begins thinking 5,000 people times how many denarii, which would buy how many loaves of bread that would be, and he comes up with the answer. You guys remember what it was? Six months' wages would not be enough 
for them to get even a little. How many of you guys are thinking that Philip is saying that's impossible? We can't do that. That's not going to happen. It just doesn't work that way. On the other hand, you guys remember what Andrew's response was? After Jesus asks the question, where are we going to find enough bread to feed all of these people? Philip responds with six months wages wouldn't be enough. And Andrew responds with something that probably made Philip shake his head. 5,000 people standing there and Andrew comes forward and he goes, oh, here's a boy, he's got five barley loaves and two fish. <laughs> Actually, Andrew still realizes the ludicrousness of what he's saying because he goes, but what's that among so many? But he kind of puts this forward as a possibility. And if you want to talk about this in terms of where the story's been going, Jesus and his disciples have traveled to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is also known as the Sea of Tiberias. They were actually doing that so that they could get away from the crowds that had been starting to follow Jesus all the time. So much so that throughout not only the Gospel of John, but in the other Gospels, we see that sometimes Jesus and his disciples actually try to avoid the towns and the villages just so that they can get some rest, just so that they can get some respite, just so that they can find some solace, just so that they can have a little bit of time to themselves. But what you find is that that's getting harder and harder and harder and harder for them to do. <clears throat> With each miracle. With each time a demon is cast out, with each time a person is healed, with each time that water is turned into wine at a wedding, with each time that Jesus walks across the water or calms the storm with a word, with each miracle, his fame grows and his fame spreads. With each time a lame person walks and each time a blind person sees and each time a deaf person hears and each time a leper is made clean, hope rises in everyone who is sick or disabled in the area. Hope rises with each family that has an individual within their family who is suffering. Hope rises with each group of friends who believe that they might be able to bring someone that they know to Jesus so that they could be restored and that they would be who they used to be and that they would do what they used to do. And so, even though Jesus and his disciples <coughs> have gotten into a boat and traveled to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, they traveled all the way across the Sea of Tiberias, the people saw the direction that they were heading. And according to what I have read, that means that they took off on foot to cross around on the other side so that they could try to get there ahead of Jesus and his disciples, which means that they would probably have walked somewhere in the neighborhood of about 12 miles. But remember, Jesus was going over there so that they could be alone. They thought that it was going to be less populated over there. That means that there were less towns and there were less villages, which means that there were less subways and McDonald's and Burger Kings that were over there. And so when the people got over there, despite the fact that it was getting close to the Passover, which was the big feast for the Jews, despite the fact that it was going to be getting close to dinner time, all of them went because they were determined or, or they were desperate or, or they were hopeful. And so they had no thought of provisioning themselves. And instead, just had thought of getting there so that they could see Jesus. So after Jesus has been teaching, after Jesus has been working with his people, finally what happens is that Jesus turns to Philip and says, where are we going to buy bread enough for all of these people to eat? And here it is. is in the answer to this question. It reveals whether or not you see possibility or whether you see obstacle, whether you see possibility or whether you see impossibility. 
one side believes that there is abundance, the other side believes that there's just not enough and it's scarcity. One disciple answers, six months wages would not be enough for each of them to have little. The other disciple answers, there's a boy here and he has five barley loaves and two fish. Now I don't actually want to blame Philip here or overly praise Andrew because quite frankly I think that both of them in the story are really quite useful. How many of you would agree with me that inside of you, just like inside of me, there's a little bit of Philip and a little bit of Andrew? I mean, we're the people who, when we're confronted with the situations, we go, yes and no. <laughs> we're the folks who say, we can, or we can't. We're the folks who say, that's impossible. And we're the same folks who say, we could maybe make a start on that. We're the people who say, no way. And the same people who say, what if we tried it this way? You see, this sermon isn't just trying to encourage you to be an optimist rather than a pessimist. It's not just trying to make you see opportunities rather than obstacles. It's deeper than all of that. The real question is, do you believe that what you see? Do you believe that the way things are now are the way that they always have to be? The real question is whether or not when we are confronted with the opportunities, whether or not we are going to let Philip or Andrew their responses prevail within us. It's a little bit like, you guys remember the old movies, the uh, old cartoons that had the central character that was there, and on the one side he had an angel on one shoulder, and on the other side he had a devil on the other one. They were trying to convince him which way to go. It's that kind of war that takes place within each of us on whether or not we're going to try, whether or not we're going to do, whether or not we're going to, or whether or not we believe that it's simply impossible and we couldn't do that and it wouldn't matter anyway. And that brings me to the question for this sermon. Because quite frankly, there's a lot of things that look like they are probably impossible when we start out alone. But my question to you then is, how big is your God? How big is your God? Because I want you guys to know that my God is so big that I believe that he can create the universe out of nothing. My God is so big that I believe that he can speak mountains and oceans and stars and solar systems and galaxies into being. Imagine what that God who could do that with nothing might be able to accomplish with five loaves and two fish. <coughs> or better yet, imagine what he might be able to accomplish with you and me and all of us in this room. You see, I think I would rather be one of the people in this world who had believed enough to begin to distribute loaves and fishes among people and begun to collect baskets full of remnants rather than being one of those people who sat on the sideline and saying it couldn't be done. I guess what I'm saying is there's nothing our Jesus can't cure. There's nothing our Jesus can't heal. There's nothing our Jesus can't recreate. There's nothing our Jesus can't forgive. There's nothing he can't reunite. There's nothing he can't re-energize. There's nothing he can't transfigure. Because I believe that the feeding of 5,000 and the healing of crowds and the casting out of demons and the incarnation and the crucifixion and the resurrection are simply proof that our God is really, 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 really big. And if I didn't believe that, I couldn't stand here and preach. Here's the problem, though, is if you don't believe that, then it all simply becomes psychology and optimism or pessimism and attitude. 
And I don't think that's what it was supposed to be all about. I thought it was supposed to be all about faith. Which means that I don't know about you. When I have those times where I've got the answer of Philip on one shoulder and the answer of Andrew on the other, I need to be reminded just how big our God really is. The hymn is number 685. It's Take My Life and Let It Be, which was an intentional choosing because if God could do that with loaves and fishes, imagine what he could do with you.
together as the people of God to pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God, our provider, awaken hunger for your truth in the church all around the world, so all are fed with your love and mercy. Hear us, O God. Hear us, Give rain to the fields that supply our bread, and care for those who tend the crops. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Raise up leaders who love truth and seek justice. Prosper the work of those who supply and oversee feeding programs in our community and around the world. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Comfort those who fear that they will not be able to feed their children. Send them healthy food and surround them with people who care. With your spirit, strengthen those who aren't satisfied lonely, rejected, or ill, especially Marguerite Jensen, Dwayne Mills, Flossie Ermacher, Delmer Van Leggen, and Riker Sternberg. Hear us, O God. Hear us, Strengthen this congregation in its service to food pantries and community meal programs. Open our eyes to your abundance when we see only scarcity. Hear us, O God. Hear us, Wipe away the tears of all who mourn, especially Denoy Smith on the loss of his father, and the loved ones of Howard Holy and Abigail Schrock. Grant us joy in the memories and witness of those who now dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. With all the saints, root and ground us in love until we know the breadth, length, height, and depth of fullness in your kingdom. Hear us, O God. Into your hands, loving God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in the grace of Jesus, our Savior, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty and merciful God, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless, preserve, and keep you this day and forevermore. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 574. serve the Lord.